Every single day, PepsiCo products are enjoyed more than 1 billion times in more than 200 countries around the world. And each year, the mammoth company generates over $70 billion in net revenue. But for that to happen, it first had to overcome multiple bankruptcies. To understand the making of PepsiCo, we need to go back all the way to the year 1889. That's when pharmacist Caleb Bradham first created Pepsi-Cola. Like many pharmacists at the time, Caleb had a soda fountain in his drugstore, where he served his own drinks. His most popular beverage was something he called Brad's Drink. It was a mix of sugar, water, caramel, lemon oil, cola nuts, nutmeg, and other additives, and it was the perfect product to refresh and energize his customers. As the drink caught on, he decided to give it a snappier name, and hoping to duplicate the success of Coca-Cola, he named it Pepsi-Cola. Just like the original cola, the drink was sweet, carbonated, and, well, cola-flavored. And it eventually became so popular that Caleb founded his own company in 1902. He called it the Pepsi-Cola Company. At first, Pepsi had been marketed as a digestive aid, and it tried to attract customers with the words exhilarating, invigorating, aids digestion. Perhaps not the most enticing slogan, but it seems like Pepsi-Cola noticed that too. As the brand flourished, they switched tactics, and they dropped the slogan and began relying more on the power of celebrities. To increase sales, they hired Barney Oldfield as a spokesman. Barney was a famous race car driver of the era, and he quickly became famous for his slogan, Drink Pepsi, it will satisfy you. The ad campaign was a massive success, and Pepsi-Cola would continue to use celebrities in the coming decades. But then, disaster struck. After many years of success, the company fell on hard times after World War I. Caleb had gambled on the fluctuations of sugar prices during the war, and believing that sugar prices would continue to rise, he bought enormous amounts of sugar. But unfortunately for him, the exact opposite happened. This left Caleb with an overpriced sugar inventory. He lost the company, and Pepsi-Cola went bankrupt. What now? At the time of Pepsi-Cola's bankruptcy, Coca-Cola had already long emerged as the dominant brand. It was being sold around the United States and numerous foreign countries, and the future could not have looked worse for tiny Pepsi. A group of creditors took over the company's trademark, patents, and other assets for just $30,000. And a couple of months later, Roy Margarel bought them out for $35,000. With full control of Pepsi, Roy worked to keep the company alive, personally loaning it money and moving the offices and plant to Richmond, Virginia. But despite his brave efforts, he was unable to keep the company solvent when the Great Depression hit. And by 1931, Pepsi-Cola was declared bankrupt again. That same year, Charles Guth entered the game. Wanting to establish a new and successful Pepsi-Cola company, he quickly got to work. And he not only had a chemist formulate a better drink, but he also set up new bottling operations. He began selling 12-ounce bottles for just 5 cents. As Pepsi was basically offering twice as much as what Coke offered in its 6-ounce bottles, it began touting itself as twice as much for a nickel. And not much later, it scored an unexpected hit as its nickel nickel radio jingle became the first to be broadcast coast to coast. Eventually, the song would be recorded in 55 languages, and it was even named one of the most effective ads of the 20th century. But there was also a problem with the lower profit margin. Charles knew that the company would have to grow if it wanted to survive. So he built bottling plants around the country and signed up hundreds of bottlers. Today, this would be called scaling. For the next two decades, Pepsi-Cola kept expanding, and when Alfred Steele became Pepsi's chief executive officer in 1950, it blew up exponentially. As a former vice president of Coca-Cola, Alfred knew it's all about advertising. 
and his emphasis on giant advertising campaigns and sales promotions increased Pepsi-Cola's net earnings 11-fold. It finally made Pepsi the chief competitor of Cola, but Cola was still outselling it by more than 5 to 1. Coke had built its dominance with three little but very powerful words, the real thing. Now, how do you compete with a slogan like that? Well, Pepsi thought they knew exactly how to do that. After all, if Coke was the original real thing, then that meant it was the choice of older people, right? Pepsi's solution was to set its sights on the then youthful baby boomers, and it shifted its focus on younger people with the theme, Pepsi, the choice of a new generation. This marketing shift began in the early 60s, and it didn't take long for it to work. In just a few years' time, Pepsi cut Coke's lead in half. The Pepsi brand was growing up quickly, and to keep up with the momentum, it kept changing in different ways. In 1964, it released its first diet soda, and with it, Pepsi became the first national cola to offer a no-calorie option to consumers. Diet Pepsi was clearly targeted at young people, and that same year, the company also acquired the popular Mountain Dew brand. Not even a year later, Pepsi-Cola merged with snack maker Frito-Lay, and PepsiCo was born. Realizing it needed to keep diversifying, the newly created PepsiCo quickly set out to do just that, and from 1977 to 1986, it purchased four major restaurant chains, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, KFC, and 7-Up International. Of course, it also kept focusing on its Pepsi brand, and things were going so well that the once-failing Pepsi was now threatening to displace Coca-Cola as the top soda brand in the US. In addition, the brand also made international headlines in 1974 when it became the first US product to be produced and sold within the USSR. But would this be enough? Although Coca remained the world's best-selling soft drink, Pepsi continued to gain market share in the 1970s and early 1980s. Their Pepsi Generation ads attracted younger drinkers, while older consumers were now targeted by its aggressive Pepsi Challenge campaign. The campaign consisted of consumers taking blind taste tests, and more often than not, they were surprised to learn they preferred the sweeter taste of Pepsi and not Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola's headquarters in Atlanta trembled with fear, and even worse was that their own research verified Pepsi's claim. Once again, there was no stopping Pepsi, and in 1984, it broke new ground when it hired Michael Jackson to be its spokesman. At the time, MJ was in the midst of his thriller success, and the creative TV commercials were such a hit that Pepsi would hire numerous other celebrities throughout the decade, such as Tina Turner, Joe Montana, and Michael J. Fox. But it was with MJ that Pepsi truly made marketing history. Back in the 80s, essentially two kinds of people existed, Coke drinkers and Pepsi drinkers. And if you loved Michael Jackson, you now had good reason to want to be part of the Pepsi clan. Coca-Cola had already offered MJ a $1 million deal, but this was rejected and the Jacksons moved on to PepsiCo instead. At the time, PepsiCo's CEO, Roger Enrico, was looking for a big idea. The goal was to make Pepsi look young and Coke look old. And who would be better for that than the king of pop? They struck a $5 million partnership, and it not only shattered the record for a celebrity endorsement deal, but it also linked the two entities for an entire decade. By 1985, War was raging in the cola duopoly, and Pepsi began to outsell Coke in supermarkets. Would this finally be enough to beat its big rival? While the war between cola and Pepsi continued, PepsiCo also had to pay attention to other aspects of its business. Between the late 1970s and early 1990s, it had continuously further expanded by buying up businesses outside of its core focus of packaged food and beverage brands. But by 1997, it became clear that these many non-core businesses were not as lucrative as they had hoped. 
While restaurants made up 36% of its portfolio, they only accounted for about 22% of its $3.7 billion profit. Realizing it would be better to simply focus on soft drinks and Frito-Lay snacks again, an exit plan was set in place, and the previously acquired fast food restaurants were spun off into a new separate company named Tricon Global Restaurants, which later became Yum Brands. After having rid itself of the fast food chains, a new era of acquisitions and mergers began, and it seemed like this time PepsiCo wanted to take a new route. Looking to add more seemingly healthy products, it acquired the Tropicana and Dole Juice brands from the Seagram Company in 1998, and in 2001 it merged with the Quaker Oats Company to form a new division, Quaker Foods and Beverages. After its massive success in the US, PepsiCo now started focusing more on expanding its operations in other countries too. By the early 2000s, Russia had already been its second largest market. And after buying a controlling interest in Russia's largest juice manufacturer in 2008, and three years later completing its acquisition of Wimbledon Foods, PepsiCo eventually grew to be the largest food and beverage company in the whole of Russia. Today, PepsiCo is one of the most successful brands in the entire world. Its product portfolio consists of a wide range of foods and beverages, including 23 brands that generate more than $1 billion each in annual sales, and the company's success is driven by an expansive food and beverage portfolio that includes Frito-Lay, Gatorade, Pepsi-Cola, Mountain Dew, Quaker, Tropicana, and SodaStream, to just name a few. Like its rivals, the Pepsi brand has diversified far beyond what Caleb Bradham could have ever dreamed of. The Pepsi Cola drink is currently almost as famous for its memorable commercials as for its never ending battle with its eternal rival. And since its inception in 1898, it has grown to be one of the most recognizable products in the world. This was the story of PepsiCo. Did you already know of its multiple bankruptcies? And which other details do you think could have been added to this story? Share it in the comments and make sure to check out our channel for more inspiring business videos.